The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. If we're ready to get started, this talk is Welcome to IPv6. I am Joni Julian. And. Okay, be that way. I should probably start with a little bit about me. Uh, my background is, well, fairly academic. I did physics and biomedical engineering and then I made the biomedical engineering jump into network management. Uh, yes. I, I, I was feeling creative that day, or something. Actually, what I did was, uh, the title of my dissertation is Network Service Management, Preparing the Internet for Telemedicine. It's the intersection of internet, SNMP for network management, and quality of service that you don't want to have. And then I set off to collect numbers and prove this. There are occasions where you need it. You probably want a better network, though, if you need it, unless there's no way around the congestion. I have worked in networking at UNC for the past 17 years. I'm now an associate director. My group is systems and services, and I like to call that the loose ends. There are the obvious bits about managing switches and routers and installing these things. And then there's everything else you need to keep it going. All the management servers, the DNS, DHCP. That's my problem. So that's who I am. The reason why I like to talk from slides is so that you can interrupt me with questions. As soon as you have a question, please, please, please ask it. There's a microphone, because I'm terrible about remembering to repeat the question. I will try. Uh, but so everybody can hear, including the recording, we would like to use the microphone. I want you to ask me questions. I want to get lost in the weeds answering questions for you. And then I can go, okay, so we're done with that. Now, where were we? And I'll look up the slides and go, ah, that's where we were. And I get back on track quickly. So the slides are here so you can interrupt me. Hopefully you recognize Vince Cerf's face. Uh, as in, I want you to use IPv6. These slides are available online. At the end of the presentation, I'll minimize this, but it's flyingpenguintech.org. Hit the resources, you can find the slides. So all of these things where I wave and say, and that's a link, you can come through later and find those. Why do we want IPv6? The first answer is obvious the IPv4 exhaustion report. We are, well, we have been running out of IPv4 addresses for a long time, and it's only getting worse with time. The more mobile devices, the more people who go, oh, hey, I'd like a piece of that. We're running out of IPv4 addresses. It's amazing that it's lasted this far, in fact. Um, and then as a joke, just to be fair, an IPv6 address exhaustion report. Uh, I believe the length of time we'll have enough IPv6 addresses uh, somewhere close to heat death of the universe. But just to be fair, there is one. So I'm often asked, well, why do I want it? It's modern. There's a good chance that you have lower latency. My proof for this is there is a shorter average AS path length for IPv6. The AS, the Autonomous System Path Length, is basically how networks are connected to each other. The IPv6 networks are more densely connected. So to get from here to there for any given here and there, you tend to go through a fewer number of networks. That, in a good case, should correlate to lower latency. It's not a guarantee, but we do like lower latency. Yes, sir?
You are correct. Um, I, I said that I'll counter that because there's only a few large backbone providers that are IPv6 that will change in time. And at some point, there will be identical latency yes. in sometime in the future. Well, hopefully, we'll all be using IPv6 at that point. But yes, at the moment, the IPv6 networks are more densely connected. They peer with as many people as they can. But when you look at that chart, if you click on that link, you will see the V6 path length is increasing and the V4 is kind of holding steady. So it is quite likely that we'll do that. And then my last point, unless you've disabled it, all modern operating systems for quite a number of years now have shipped with IPv6 enabled by default. So unless you've taken action to disable it, you're probably already using it and don't know it. In which case, if you're already using it, let's learn a little more about it. And sometimes I'm asked a variant of that question, which is instead of someone saying, what to me, why do I want to use it? They ask me why I want to use it. Just because my ISP gives me one address to connect to the internet doesn't mean I want to tunnel everything through that and set up a little DMZ and what port's listening and how am I going to jump off. No, actually, I quite like being at work and going, oh, I wanted to do something on this machine, and just jumping directly over to it, bringing up what I was working on at home. There are also regional exhaustions. LACNIC was the most recent one that exhausted their IPv4 allocations. Uh, Microsoft just ran out. Yes, Azure just ran out. So uh, now they were able to address that quickly, but it is happening. It is happening right now. I love this quote from Martin Levy. You can either do a careful planned migration, or you can have a mad panic because someone says, we needed it yesterday. And you should know full well that panicking is more expensive. I completely agree with him. Although I have to admit, when I was told, completely cold, and you will now be turning on IPv6 on your servers, I still had that moment of panic. But it was followed with a, a grateful sense of, wait, I don't have to rush to do this. I can take my time. I don't have a deadline. I just have to do this. And then you can be more calm. So I would rather learn my way around on my own, without a panic, without something broken on fire that has to be fixed right now. IPv6, by having more addresses than we need, means that we can eliminate network address translation. And that makes my troubleshooting, shall we say, fairly interesting. And I don't mean the good kind of interesting. And if you decide you need to reboot a NAT and you may have a large number of users behind it, well, they're stateful. And anything stateful that has to reboot and lose state and start over from scratch, that's also uh, interesting. And the only way to avoid this is not to need more addresses and throw in a good firewall. A NAT, because it's stateful, comes with a, st a stateful firewall essentially for free. It's not the NAT that's keeping you safe. It's the nice stateful firewall. So this sticker has been going around. Caution, legacy IP only. This product does not support the current generation of internet protocol IPv6. As yet another reason why you want to support this. Let's be modern. There's a nice little infographic if you want to read around and how all the things fit together at a high level overview. This is come find the slides, click on that link later. So now let's get started. What, what are the basics here? It's a 128-bit address instead of the measly 32-bit addresses of IPv4. We write it as eight hexadecimal fields. So four hex characters, colon, four hex characters. Do that eight times. So you got used to dotted quad. Sorry about this. It's going to be much longer. What are we going to do when our addresses are much longer and we can't just rattle off a few key addresses that we know by heart? 
<laughs> Perfect answer. Drop zeros and use DNS. In any group, you can drop the leading zeros. And if you have a whole string of zeros in the middle, you can drop all of those as well and replace them with a double colon. So then you have to go back and count how many did I drop. Actually, you usually don't. There are tools like IPv6 calc or online. Go to v6decode.com and it'll fill all that in for you. The big one, and if you've ever enjoyed a broadcast flood, you'll appreciate this. There is no broadcast in IPv6. And at first you go, yeah, no broadcast flood. That was my first response. And then I go, wait, I've got a number of things that rely on broadcast, like ARP. How am I going to make anything work without ARP? Well, there are different kinds of multicast that we use. And since I've been at this for 17 years, I also know to shudder when someone says, oh, let's just turn on multicast. However, link local multicast and layer two multicast have always worked really well. And those are what we use to replace ARP and the simple tools where we've done our broadcast. Because that's the same level the broadcast was working at. It stayed within your local area network or your VLAN. Well, so do our layer two and link local multicasts. So these work really well, except they're multicast instead of broadcast. And of course, we get to keep unicast. There are no, strictly speaking, there are no private addresses. When they were designing IPv6, they said, Greenfield, we're going to get rid of all of the cruft. And then people came back with their very good reasons for having private address space. We use it for things other than NAT. So then they came back and said, well, we'll give you something else. It's, we could use link local addresses. We could use site local with a low time to live so they couldn't leave a given region. But we also have unique local addresses. These are addresses that can never be routed on the internet, and you don't get NAT as a loophole to take care of this. So these are really, really private addresses in the truest sense of it. Yes, sir? When you said that they couldn't be routed on the public internet, are there actually routers that black hole that and null it like they do with the private v4 addresses? I would assume look for uh, Bogon announcements like on BGP Mon. Uh, translation. I certainly hope so. Originally, there was no DHCP. They said, oh, we've got this stateless, stateless local address auto configuration slack for you. You don't need that DHCP. Again, we're talking about some academics saying, Greenfield, how are we going to make it better? We're going to make it so you don't need DHCP to get an address automatically. And that is fantastic. And Slack works really well. And then people came back and said, well, we use DHCP for more things than address assignment. Like, here's your name server. Here are some other useful servers. And they went, ah, OK. And now we have DHCP v6 too. IPsec is built in. So instead of the back port of IP security to run on IPv4, it was baked in from the beginning to use it. And yeah, and now it has been removed as the default because everybody went, have you looked at the calculation overhead? So you can see that this uh, IPv6 was first ratified in 1998. That's why it's a little bit surprising we don't have a larger deployment of it now. And there's been a lot of back and forth negotiation on, ooh, Greenfield, let's make something nice new and followed with the cold water of reality. This is what we actually need. So all of this starts coming back in. And truthfully, when I see IPsec and IPv4, a lot of it's zeroed out and they haven't done the full calculation. So I put it at about the same level. And the less used options in the IPv4 header have become optional. So uh, most of us think of it as the diff serve code point, but that's actually supposed to be the type of service byte in the IPv4 header. Well, 
if we didn't use it for so long that we came up with a creative reuse of it, meh, it's optional. So the address size, huge, making our packet header larger. But at least we then simplified everything but the addresses. And the next thing I usually hear is, it's so different. Not really. You just need to learn the translations. Most of what you already know about networking is still true, unless it says broadcast in it. Everything you know is still valid. We just need to change the words a little bit. Don't say broadcast, say multicast. Don't say IPv4, say IPv6. Instead of ARP, which is a broadcast protocol, we have NDP, Neighbor Discovery Protocol, and it's part of ICMP v6. And this means you cannot block all ICMP and have your IPv6 network work. Instead of ping and trace route, we have ping 6 and trace route 6. And just as soon as you're getting comfortable saying, OK, I'll just tack a 6 on the end of the command name, oh no. There's the host command or host minus 6. This, when I say host minus 6, tells the host command, you will use IPv6 for transport. If you want to get a v6 address back, instead of doing the dash t a to get an a record, you do dash t quad a. Actually, I believe that host uh, will, by default, pull up a and quad a records. It, it will if you don't give it a, a dash t. That is correct. Yes. Also, it's very dig, convenient. Dig is the same way. The dash six is simply to uh, um, use the transport. Yes, many commands are like that. A lot of times, since most commands do the proper try v6 first, fail back to IPv4, a lot of times when I throw in the minus six, I'm saying, no, no, I'm going to make you use IPv6 for transport because I want to know if that's broken. Because I'm the person who has to go fix it. So I will frequently put this in when I think it should work, just out of habit. It never hurts to run an extra test. You should always test your assumptions. I assume my V6 is working most of the time, and I'm going to test it as part of my daily work. And then when you go, OK, I stick a 6 on the end or a minus 6 flag, and then we get to IP tables. We go from IP tables to IP6 tables. I don't know why. I just work here and read the man pages. And then you go, well, it sounds like multicast is going to be important. So we would need our IGMP snooping again, right? <laughs> Guess what? That's another one where we have to change the name. So instead of internet group membership protocol, multicast listener discovery is the V6 analog. So again, everything you know is true. Everything that's good about IGMP snooping is also true for MLD snooping, except it's got a different name, which means you probably have to turn it on separately. Uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison has a nice list of troubleshooting tools by platform. Because I'm being a little bit, uh, I'm sweeping the dirty laundry under the rug when I say you can do ping and ping 6. Not all platforms have ping 6. University of Wisconsin-Madison has a nice chart of, you know, on Windows, you do it this way. On Mac, you do it this way. On these flavors of Linux, you do it this way. On these flavors of BSD, you do it this other way. So they've got a far more comprehensive table. I'm just trying to make it fit on one screen. To reiterate again, because this makes the ARP replacement work, you cannot turn off ICMP v6. If you've blocked ICMP, all kinds, even your local area network will not work if you've blocked it inside the network. So one thing, when I teach this class, we get to the multicast parts of IPv6, and I pull out my phone, and I look at my students, and I say, what do we all say about this? What's the meme? There's an app for that. And I say, OK, we're doing IPv6. Here's your meme. There's a multicast group for that. And they all laugh, but you know what? They all remember it, too. So the good news is I figured out how to get them to remember there's a multicast group for it. And I'll give you my story on discovering there's a multicast group for it. 
Uh, side note to this story, my coworkers will say, what's the IPv6 multicast group for, you know, fill in the blank. And they all think I'm really good at looking this up because they'll send it to me on IM or they'll call me on the radio and ask that. And I have the answer quickly. No, I don't have these memorized. I'm just really fast at hitting the Wikipedia article on multicast, jumping to the IPv6 section and looking it up for them. So there is no brilliance here. You refer to Wikipedia for it. My story on how I learned this the hard way is when I was first setting up our DHCP v6 server. I took our v4 settings and was just sort of like, I'm just going to copy them over and play with places to drop the number six in. And most of them were pretty straightforward. Option, option six. So I was happily buzzing along, trying to make DHCP v6 look just like our production DHCP v4. And I copied over the NTP option. And doggone it, the server kept crashing on that. And I start, you know, muttering and fuming. I'm sort of like, but I want to set the time server for them. Like, you know, what are people going to do without this? I'm used to setting all of these conveniences. Finally, instead of muttering too much, my brain kicked in and I went, I wonder if there's a multicast group for that. And I went to Wikipedia and guess what? That's why you don't set it with DHCP. There's a multicast group for that. And then I was laughing at myself because he got bit by my own reminder. So learn from my lesson. See if there's a multicast group for that. Again, beating this over the head. There is no broadcast. If we do v6 multicast over Ethernet, meaning we're doing layer 2 multicast, instead of doing all Fs, we start with 33 colon 33, and then the last 32 bits of the IPv6 address. In theory, this will address multiple machines, but not all of them, making it multicast. In reality, given that there's a lot of unused address space, you're probably not going to hit all that many machines on the same local area network with the same last 32 bits. So, okay, yeah, you might hit two or three machines, and you know, if you hit three, two of them are going to ignore this message. In reality, it does not happen that often. So that's our layer two multicast. If we want to do our link local multicast, so jump up to layer three, but still keeping it local, the most useful one is the all hosts addresses is FF02 colon colon one. So if you want to say, you know, hey everybody, who's out there? You use that multicast address instead of the 250, you know, all 255s or your subnet 255. Instead of using your normal IPv4 broadcast address, replace it with that one and you will hit all hosts. There's an all routers multicast group. There's the NTP. There's the, we got one of everything in multicast here. But these are the simplest ones. If you see 3333, you go, ah, we got some IPv6 layer 2 multicast. You see the FFO2, oh, we got some link layer multicast. Which then leads to the next question. Wait, if I've been running this all along and don't know it, uh, what's my address? Very good question. You, know, you can still use IF config, but I'm starting to make friends with the IP command. So IP adder show will give you all of your IP addresses, v4 and v6. In Windows, IP config or, and I'm just pulling this from the University of Wisconsin-Madison chart, NetShell, I bet, yeah, NetShell interface IPv6 show address. A lot more typing, but in theory that should work. I haven't actually touched Windows and I was trying to count six or seven years. So exercise left for the reader should you have that problem. So, running one example, I pulled up a VM to play around with for this, called Moose, if config, eth0, and then I played around with my interfaces, it's eth1 later. You can see I have a v4 address, 
that I actually mangled. I have an IPv6 address here, and I have a link local address here. What you'll see at the end is it says scope global here, and it says scope local here. So this is my link local address. This is my global unicast address. And then the rest of the standard if config. What's interesting and confusing about this is you will get multiple addresses per interface. When you mangled it, you actually chose an interesting IP that's owned by the DOD. Yeah. I get to have fun with this, don't I? <laughs> Which is why it makes a perfect documentation example. Uh, what I've used right here, the 2001 DB8, is actually the documentation space for IPv6. So we have a documentation range. Use this as your dummy address when you're giving examples for IPv6. We don't for IPv4, so. And I'm sure we'll end up using them for NAT at some point. Oh, was I being sarcastic? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this is the wrong time to ask about carrier grade NAT and what you think about it. I have an opinion. I'm going for it. That said, I like to start with the humorous part. Carrier grade NAT by layering NAT. There are a number of applications, we're probably all familiar with them, where NAT breaks said application. And most things we figured out how to live with and make our peace with NAT. I have not linked it in any of the slides, I should. There is a very nice blog post on all of the additional things, things that work with regular NAT, that break in carrier grade NAT. It's a large number of games and peer-to-peer -peer applications. So a lot of users will notice and a lot of ISPs won't care. Carrier grade NAT is actually triple NAT. So double NAT, there are things that will still work there. But for the most part, most of your average Facebook using users don't care. So we could, if we implement carrier grade NAT, if we implement carrier grade NAT on a wide scale deployment, we could get back a large <laughs> yeah. I think our definition of normal users is somewhat different. I work at a university. I have a lot of students. They would be looking for a direction to point their lynch mob for most of carrier grade NAT. So, yes, the, the users most ISPs want will be perfectly happy with double netting. But there are additional things that break once you turn on carrier grade NAT. And my point is, we don't need it. There's this huge space of addresses that we can turn on. And it's been running for a long time. And it actually works. So let's just go turn on the stuff that doesn't make us do nasty things that break applications.
because he got a stateful firewall for free. We need vendors to include stateful firewalls that don't expect the NAT in front of them. Some of them have. We'll get people trained to use the right ones. That did get tested earlier. OK, I'll repeat your question. Um, so if there are no private addresses that can be routed over the internet, then how are carriers expecting to use carrier NAT? They're layering the V4 NAT for you. The carrier grade NAT is a way to avoid turning on IPv6. And we do have the unique local addresses. You, you could probably come up with something evil there. His question was, um, actually, <laughs> if there are no IB, IVP6 addresses that can be used locally and routed over the internet, then how are carriers supposed to use carrier based net? And that's because it's a V4 creature. The carrier grade NAT is the lame carrier excuse not to turn on IPv6. We could have four layers of NAT. <laughs> so, true story. At work, instead of swearing, I try to be a little more creative in what I say. I have been known to say, oh, flap, because routers flapping is a very bad thing. This makes my coworkers giggle, usually breaks the tension of what we're looking at. I also use doubly natted as a curse. <laughs> I say, oh, they might as well be doubly natted. This also has the effect of making my coworkers laugh because I have cursed them in a network troubleshooting sense. This is what I think of nat. Getting back to my point, because I have slides to remind me where I was going, when you get assigned, in your mind you're probably thinking, an IPv6 address, you're actually getting a whole bunch of addresses. We've got the address space, we're going to use the elbow room. Loop back is colon colon one. For as many interfaces as you have, they'll all have a colon colon one for loop back to address them. All of your interfaces, it can be just wired and wireless. You can have a quad NIC and have multiple Ethernet interfaces. All of them will have that loopback. All of them will have a link local address where they can link local, talk to everybody else on the VLAN. Starts with FE80. So they'll all have a loopback. They'll all have a link local. And in most cases, they'll all have their global. IPv6 address. And guess what? And you go, OK, OK, so we're up to three addresses. I can deal with this. Oh, no. Actually, you usually get a whole bunch of random addresses that change periodically in there. This is called privacy extensions. The first version of Slack, the stateless local address auto configuration that I mentioned, took your 48-bit MAC address, crammed some numbers in the middle, flipped a high order bit, and made it into a 64-bit number called EUI64. And then somebody went, but then I can be tracked at work, going over to Starbucks, going over here, the other place, because the last part of your address, the last 64-bit, never changed. So the first 64 bits would say, I was at Starbucks, I was at work, I was somewhere else. And then the last 64, that's your fingerprint. And everybody went, eek, I'm scared of this. I don't want to be tracked. So new RFC privacy extensions. And that just says, you're going to get your original Slack address. And then we're going to throw in some random addresses. And it seems to be about every half hour on my machine. And every half hour, we're going to pick a new one. So if you're like me and have some long standing connections running, I have my EUI64 address. I have a random address that I started using a couple hours ago, but the connection is still running. And maybe a couple more of those. And then the current random one. 
And the random addresses that will time out are marked deprecated. It'll say, don't use this one for new connections, but I'm still using that address for a long running connection that it can't figure out why I'm still logged into one of my servers because that's what I do. So you get a ton of addresses in V6. Don't panic, we've got the address space. Nobody cares, we're not upset. But you do have to change from saying, what's my IPv6 address to what are my IPv6 addresses? Oh well, we got the room to spare. If you want to disable it or enable it when it's not turned on, Google is your friend for pick a platform and pick where you would like it to go if it's not there already. Yes, sir. Sorry, going back uh, now that you've changed pages. Well, of course. Okay, I can understand the concept of these, quote, privacy extensions, mm -hmm. paranoia rules, we know that, especially for those of us in the programming business. But, <laughs> okay, so incoming connections cannot use this connection, period, correct, or this address. Establishing new, you do not establish a new connection on the old privacy address. No, no, but there's always no. a new one. Incoming. Oh, incoming. You uh, can only use these addresses for outgoing connections, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, the dirty trick there, the one that I use for my machines at home, is they don't use it, but the EUI64 address is always there and always valid. So when I want to address my machines and I don't want to care what their privacy extension address is at this very moment, I hit the EUI64 address. Or your or I assign it a static. created address, yes. Yes. Yes, there's always a way to skin that cat. It's just a different cat in IPv6. Yes, sir. Mike. Ooh. Do you happen to know what the... Um national carrier um, adoption is for IV, IVP6 is it how, which I, ISPs have it which ones don't um, and what good is going through the effort of building the land out of it if the carrier you have doesn't support it that's been a huge question who goes first content providers or the ISPs and everybody has been pointing their finger at somebody else to do it first um, John Curran ended recently with a call to the content providers to do it. That said, all of the ISPs in my area claim to offer IPv6. And it's only once you get down into the implementation details of, no, really. And it will be things like Time Warner Cable says they offer it. And I go over to my mom's house, go into her router, check the box next to IPv6. Hmm, nothing. Reboot everything in sight? Hmm, nothing. There's a lot of claim of it. It's patchy on how that's done. There's a project at Cisco in their measurement lab to, I think they call it IPv6 penetration, world map, and they show how much they're able to measure in the various countries. And to, uh to ask another question here, when you were talking about um, incoming connections, so you have, um, like what's a traditional port forward right now behind that, and you're outside, um, say you're here and you want a VPN, I'm assuming you'd just be using an I, IVP, uh, IPv6 address in all of your software on this yes. end. Uh, the VPN software that I use personally, is open VPN. I have no trouble setting up V6 tunnels with that. I want to go back to the first question. Um, at least in the national carriers, all of them support V6 mm -hmm. um, in the backbone. Um, so if you are a large business and you have, you pay thousands of dollars for your internet connection, a lot, you know, you're at a one gig or a 10 gig link, you have no problem getting a V6 um, connection. 
If you are a residential user or a small business user, good luck. Yes, what he said. So unfortunately, it feels like a lot of what I do now, you know, visit my mom, for example, and, uh, okay, now I have to call Time Warner, listen to the standard, even, I even sometimes go through the, what's that? Why do you want that? <laughs> This does not sit well with me. As Zach said, may I speak to your manager? Magic words there. It's also good for my blood pressure. Gives me a chance to catch my breath. Okay, I'm good now. The reason why we're spending so much time on the V6 addresses, a wise coworker of mine, we call her Cindy. We sent her off to IPV6 training. Three days later, she came back. And she said, once you understand the addressing, you're most of the way there. OK. This is why we're talking about the addresses. I have two favorite online tools to decode their addresses. You know, and it'll come up and it'll say, this is a global unicast. Oh, this is an EUI64. Here's the MAC address. Uh, Tavian, it's a Perl script. There's a link there for, ooh, if you want to run this on your own web server. And V6 decode, that's got the shiny JavaScript. You hover over it, it'll pop up and tell you what this word is doing and what that one's doing. If you'd rather have a command line tool, and many days I would rather, IPv6 calc, very simple. Yes, I had to build it by hand. Um, I think it is probably the easiest software I have ever built by hand. Oh, and then just because I wanted to throw it in somewhere, I can rattle off IP 0800 in my sleep. I know the frame type of IP. So for those of you who rattle off 0800 is the frame type of IP, update your brains, 86DD, frame type for IPv6. So again, everything's the same. We just changed a few of the names and frame types. So once we start talking about addresses, and we try to dive in, the next thing we have to cover is there are different scopes for them. And that's basically, how big? How many people can you talk to? Loop back. Clearly, you're only talking to yourself. That address, again, is colon, colon, one. Link local, which keeps you on your local area network, your VLAN only. That is automatic. That's an automatic address. It's almost always the EUI 64. And it's unrouted starts with FE80. So you can get to where, ah, colon, colon, one, loop back. Oh, FE80, I know that. That's just our link local. For a while, and again, IPv6 has been through a couple iterations based on feedback. Originally, there was a uh, site local, VEC0. That has been deprecated for the unique local addresses. And those start with FD, it's a slash eight. So more room than you would ever need for your unique local addresses. The global unicast addresses, the IANA assigned, uh, is uh, 2,000 colon, or 2,000 colon, colon, slash 3 is what we're using for global unicast right now. You still get your assignments from IANA. This is the documentation range that I mentioned earlier, 2001 DB8 is our documentation. Personally, I think of the DB9 video connector and say, OK, one less than that for documentation. And we do also still have any cast addresses showing up in here. So again, with the scopes and the ranges. And guess what? We have those for our V6 addresses. We have the exact same scopes for the multicast. We want to talk to the same groups and do the talk amongst yourselves multicast for them. So that's a link to, I believe it was IANA, and their list of here's what we're using for v6 multicast. FF slash 8 is all of multicast. So if it starts with FF, you can go, oh, that's our v6 multicast. And everybody can go, wow, how'd you recognize it? Well, it starts with FF. FF01 is interface local. FF02 is link local. And then for any given multicast scope, colon, colon, one is all nodes. 
and colon colon two is all routers. And then we can mix and match. Do we want to be, you know, interface local, all nodes, or link local, all nodes, or all routers, or you get to mix and match what the multicast prefix means with what the multicast suffix means. Or you can learn to look things up very quickly in Wikipedia. I tend to recommend that one, actually. So these are the V6 addresses that I pester my coworkers to know on site. I'm not going to quiz anybody in here on do you know these by site. But the ones that I think are good to know, colon, colon, one is loopback. It's only one digit to remember. OK, so we put two colons in front of it. It's three characters to remember, and it means loopback. OK, that's a nice, simple one. If it starts with FE80, that's our link local unicast. That's keep it in the VLAN, folks. If you see FFFE in the middle of the address, you know, there's the network prefix, and then the 64 bits that are left have FF colon FE stuck in the middle. You see the FFFE, and you go, oh, that's the EUI64 address. I have your MAC address. Uh, 2002 slash 16 is the 6 to 4 range from IANA. Uh, when I started poking subnet online, to because I like to check my facts on a couple of sources, they seem to be using some older ranges as well. And then I went, in this case, I'm just going to ask Tavian or V6 decode whichever's up in my browser right now to decode it. The 6 to 4 relay uses this Anycast address. And then if you see something that starts with FF, the whole FF00 slash 8 is multicast. Yeah, so we got a couple of Fs to remember. We got our colon, colon 1, and the FFFE in the middle. Not too serious. I also add in for my coworkers, and I want you to recognize this is our network prefix at UNC. Because, well, they work here. They'd better recognize our global addresses. And then you go, well, does it matter how I get my V6? Do I have to get it from my provider because I'm just a lowly residential user and they don't care? So pulled out an old chart. They're measuring the added latency when using V6 compared to V4 traffic for the same users. They had some large project to do this. Notice the one that has the least variation, and in fact has a couple of times where it's faster, okay, a little slower there, was actually faster than V4 here. Little increase, little decrease, increase. This ripple, to me that green line is clearly the one you want to have because it has the least variation. Not only do I, I dislike latency the most, but I'm not a real fan of jitter either. And that green line, is native IPv6. So if you can get it, native IPv6 is best. Performance of IPv6. You're going, OK, I'm ready to turn it on. Well, I want you to be ready for certain interesting performance problems. The mandate, the RFC says, prefer v6. Use V6 first. If that doesn't work, use V4. Well, actually, the second statement is my interpretation of it. The mandate is just prefer V6. So once upon a time, I was very new to turning this on. I went to the DNS folks, and I said, hey, could you give me some V6 addresses for our name servers? And they put those in first before I had turned on the V6 address on the name servers. <laughs> I, I see one face of understanding. I was humming along happily. I then, you know, did secure shell to my name server. I'm starting to add the address. Again, I haven't touched Windows in many years. And I'm happily buzzing along, looking over it. OK, Google says turn it on this way. Quite happily buzzing along when suddenly my system administrator darkened my doorstep. And he was not a happy camper. He said, why can't I get into the name servers right now? He's sort of like, are they down? Do I need to go fix something? 
It's like, no, they're not down. I'm in right now. And after a few back and forth and some, it's okay. If they're not down, you don't have to have a panic. He was also in a panic because his monitoring tools hadn't told him they were down. He just couldn't connect to them. So this had caused huge panic. Why are these servers down? But I'm logged into them right now. Um, what had happened on his Windows machine was that it was trying to connect to the v6 address, failing and stopping there. So be aware that different platforms may do this differently. I got to learn this one the hard way, I would say, since there was a little bit of yelling and temper involved. This may also cause, the problem is called happy eyeballs. Some browsers render things as they come in. Internet Explorer does not. So when we have tested v6 only Internet Explorer, we've had it take, ooh, seven minutes on the university homepage because Flickr is v4 only and there's a uh, Flickr stream at the bottom. So some things do prefer v6 nicely, fail over silently, fairly quickly. I didn't even notice the additional lag when I was connecting to the name servers and my sysadmin couldn't. So some things just work, some things don't. V6 has a feature called neighbor unreachability detection. And I think the reason why I didn't have to go through a full timeout cycle and the reason why I didn't notice the delay was there was a quick, you know, you do your NDP, your ARP equivalent, can I reach this? Quickly got back neighbor unreachable and went, okay, fail over to V4, I'm good. So I didn't have to go through the full timeout there, which is why I didn't even notice it happening. Uh, neighbor unreachability detection. I call this NUD. I call Windows a NUDnik. Oh, right. Probably should have gone to this slide already. NDP, Neighbor Discover Protocol, part of ICMP v6. We start with a neighbor solicitation. Uh, that's considered a request packet, ICMP v6 informational, not error type 135, answered by a neighbor advertisement. That's the reply, info 136. You send this to the solicited node multicast address, FFO2, colon, colon, one. That just means a stream of zeros has been dropped, colon, FF. You don't have to have your string of zeros be butted up against the end. It can be literally in the middle, and you can have a whole nother word to go. And then the last 24 bits or slash or uh, the three bytes of the V6 unicast address done as a slash 104. You can build this address. You go to this multicast address. Hey, who has this IPv6 address? But again, just like the layer two multicast, it's actually a pretty small number of hosts that are gonna fit in there. And you may not have, think of this like a hash table. We have a large table of IPv6 addresses. We don't have very many spots filled out. How many times are we gonna have a hash table collision? Not too often. How many times are we going to have multiple v6 addresses essentially hash out to this with their last 22, 24 bits? Not that often. It doesn't matter if they do, it's just multicast. And the host will go, oh hey, this one's not for me, and ignore it. So showing where moose has the colon colon, we could be putting in all of these zeros, and I gave it the fake documentation range, so you would put in the leading zero there. So it's solicited node multicast address, stepping through all of that again, FFO2 colon colon one colon FFO013. That's without the leading zeros. And this is where I get into the NUD, the neighbor unreachability detection. Well, I used to be able to look at my ARP table. Please tell me there's an NDP table I can look at. Why, yes. Yes, there is. You can do NDP in a host name or NDP-A for all, dash D for delete, dash N to do it numeric and skip the name resolution. Wait, this should look really familiar if you've ever played with your ARP table. If NDP isn't present because, hint, this is a BSD command. So let's say you're running Red Hat Enterprise Linux like I do at work. Then you'll need to use the nicely overloaded IP command. IP 
he can say it's in the INET6 family, neighbor, or the one I use is IP-6 neighbor show. And again, with the IP command, as soon as, you, as soon as you've uniquely identified it, you can start dropping things. So you could also say nay show, which makes for interesting command readouts. So there's always a way to skin that cat. Again, I would recommend going to the University of Wisconsin-Madison chart. They show you which ones where ARP goes to NDP and which ones where ARP goes to really long IP command. Again, I went through the prefer v6 and my little snarky nudnik comment. This is what an IPv6 packet looks like. Version, traffic class, flow label, payload length, Next header, if you decide to turn on any of the optional options, I can tell you how many times I've seen that turned on. Hop limit. We just renamed the time to live of the IPv4 packet because it wasn't actually a time to hop limit. But it's still, every router decrements that by one until you throw it away at zero. And then because the addresses are so big, Huge 128-bit source address. Huge 128-bit destination address. OK, yeah, that's huge. Notice how all of the error checking has been moved to the other layers. TCP checks, Ethernet checks with the cyclic redundancy checksum. And they say, meh, shouldn't need it at this layer. The other layers will get it. Oh, already said all of that. Most higher level protocols above this don't need a change. Some of them, isn't FTP everybody's whipping child for things that break when you make a little tiny change, like oh, say NAT? Um, some applications need a little bit of help. Most, well, by, some protocols need a little bit of help. Some don't. Wouldn't it be nice? Except I haven't used FTP in quite a while. SFTP or SCP, but yes, I really wish we could do something better. Summary of all the nice little tools, reminder that you get multiple addresses. Conclusion, all of your instincts, they're still good. We just changed the names to protect the guilty, I guess. Don't be afraid of your IPv6. If you have more questions, I'll be at the Flying Penguin table. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.